Okay. So, um, just want to recap what we've been up to. Okay, so we are uh, we've been talking about Lorenz and Hong Kong symmetry transformations. Space-time symmetry is concerned. 
we have discovered through just through the analysis of the representation of this uh, conqueror group that for massive particles, um, the quantum Hilbert space must describe, if it is covariant under Lorentz and space-time translations, uh, it must be labeled by momentum, mass, and spin. Okay. So uh, how we got that, uh, just very roughly uh, as a brief recap, is that we have to choose a reference with momentum. And what Wigner told us is that you can analyze the, uh, so, so Wigner's analysis, uh, I think it's called the induced representation. Induced representation. Uh, and what, it, what he tells us is that you have to, he, he was able to show that by choosing a reference momentum, the appropriate reference momentum, the representations of the whole group can be reduced to uh, analyzing what's called the middle group. Okay, so let me just summarize it. Choose uh, reference momentum. And then, uh, so Whitman showed, uh, Whitman showed, uh, depending, as you say, just depending, depending on whether m is zero or m is non-zero. Okay. So what Whitman showed was that uh, the, the representations, actually I should say irreducible representations, of Poincaret, uh, can be reduced to finding uh, finding the, the representations of the group that leaves the reference momentum in the ring. I won't show that, but but I just want to give you at least a flavor of it. So, but, so in particular, for the mass greater than zero case, the reference momentum was the momentum that you take a uh, uh, general uh, momentum and boost it to its rest frame. And so then it will just be m and zero, zero, zero. Okay. And in this thing, the little group, so this, this group is called the little group. And in this thing, you find that the little group is SO3. Okay. Because it is the group that leaves at zero in the room, but it doesn't doesn't mix the um, it doesn't mix any, any, anything. So, so uh, it leaves that reference momentum uh, fixed. Uh, again, uh, there are a lot of details that I'm going to skip over because I'm just going to tell you what the, the mass, massless result is. Um, let's try this color. So you have to think that and think that and think that. Um, so, for the, for the massless case, it turns out that the reference momentum, of course, is not the same as this guy because there is no rest frame. Okay, so remember, there's no rest frame. And this turns out to give uh, quite dramatically different results for this. So in the reference frame, in the, in the, uh, sorry, in the massless case, I mean, uh, there's no rest frame, but what you can do is to orient your uh, momentum in, say, the third direction. So then your your momentum will just look like 1, 0, 0, 1. Right? So just going one direction. It doesn't matter because uh, we assume that space-time is, uh, or space is rotationally invariant. So you can always just take 
uh, any direction you want, and you just call that your third axis. Right? And so the little group here, uh, you might think, is the two-dimensional rotation group. Right? Because it's what will leave these two guys in vagrant that is zero. So that's, it will leave it untouched. And it turns out that basically for physical applications, that's the right answer. But if you are very careful, it, it would turn out that it's not quite true. It turns out there's a combination of boosts and rotations um, that, that can also leave this invariant. Right? So that's less obvious. So, but it turns out that that part, so the little group is, let me just write it down, the little group is um, SO2. That's part of the answer. But there's also uh, a certain combination of boots and rotations. Is you have to do it both at the same time to leave it in bigger. Either boost alone or rotations alone, anything other than SO2 is not, it's not going to work. Uh, SO2, I should say, in the 1, 2, 10. So it turns out that this, this is the full answer. But, so here's the mystery. Uh, so what happens is that, in this case, the representation, so that's O3, is what you spend two semesters of quantum mechanics learning. You learn that the representation, so that's O3, is exactly what we call spin. It's exactly this label over here. Right, and we find that spin takes on uh, a range of either half or full integer. In this case, uh, XO2 is very similar. I'll come to that in a, in a little bit. But when you talk about this part of the group, it turns out that you can allow, if you continue to call it spin, you can, you, you can actually allow for continuous spin. Some books don't even talk about it. I don't know whether Pesky and Schroeder talks about it. I, I forgot where I learned this from, actually. But, but uh, you can find some discussion of it in, in some group theory. Um, so, but we don't see such things in nature. Right? We don't, uh, so, so let me just say this, not seen in nature. That sometimes I hear people say that it's not physical. I'm not an expert on this. But I know a few years ago, uh, there was a group of physicists from the Perimeter Institute who constructed theories that basically gave you continuous spin. So it's, it, it seems to me like, again, I'm not an expert, but it seems, at least on the surface, that you can construct theories that give you continuous spin. It's just that, as, as of right now, it's not realized in nature. Right? So maybe some of you guys who are in particle uh, experiments and start looking for such particles, right? how would it, what would the signatures look like you know, if you have continuous spin particles? That would be very interesting, I think. Um, but, but, so I'm going to ignore it because we don't see it. So most of the discussion you'll find will just ignore it right away and you'll just focus on this, this part, the SO2 part of the uh, representation. And what this gives you is that it basically gives you spin, but only along the, the z direction. Right? Because rotation in the two, in the one two plane is basically saying I'm rot remember that's that's the same as saying I'm rotating about the the third axis. Right? So this is rotation around the third axis which in fact means you're taking the spin and then you're dotting it in the direction of the momentum because the momentum we're assuming is in the direction. And this in fact has a particular name. This is called helicity. Helicity in, in, uh, specifically means the spin in the uh, direction of motion. That's, let me, let me write it down. This is spin in the direction of motion of momentum. Okay. 
but because of that, because you're only looking at SO2 and not the full SO3, it turns out that, for example, uh, when you talk about masses uh, spin one particle, uh, you do not have, so if you have a massive spin one, for example, Well, you know that spin 1, S equals to 1, means that you can have different pro M, uh, M, M sub S projections. Okay, so this is the quantum mechanics. It can be 1, 0, or minus 1, which is just a way of counting. If even if I tell you that spin 1, how many degrees of freedom does spin 1 have? And the answer is 3. But it turns out for massless, Massless spin one, spin zero always has only just uh, uh, zero. Spin half is just uh, you know, uh, and, and s is just of course just plus or minus one half. There's no choice. But when you have and it's the same here, so it's massive spin half. Uh, the projection is just plus or minus one half. Spin 2, for example, we can have 2, 1, 0, minus 1, minus 2. Right. So again, this is this classification is something that you can get out of. Once you have learned your quantum mechanics, you learn that this is the eigenvalue of J, J3. Right. But in this case, uh, you only care, care about the J, J3 direction. So you can only, you, it turns out that SO2 only gives you, uh, for massless spin 1, you only have class helicity. I should really call it lambda. I think that's what people call it. But, but this, this corresponds to this, this guy here. So lambda is only class or minus 1. And for massless spin 2, you can only have class or minus 2. Right. So the strict way of doing it is, of course, you got to look at look at its generators. You got to impose some boundary conditions, and uh, you will find that these are the only possible um, eigenvalues of the generators. Uh, there's only one generator, here, J. J, which generates. So why I highlight this is that you see that for massless massive spin one, there are three degrees of freedom. Okay, so this is what something that you feel very, very, uh, very often in field theory uh, literature. There are five degrees of freedom uh, for 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 massive spin two, and but when you come to massless case, uh, the spin half is the same. You either have plus or minus uh, uh, possibilities, and then also same thing for the massive spin half. But for once you go to the massless case, you see that there are only two degrees of freedom for the massless case. And there are also only two degrees of freedom for the um, uh, spin two. So there is a jump going from the photon to its massive counterpart. There's a jump from two to three. For the graviton, there's a jump from 2 to 5, in fact. So there's a huge difference between, because it's not a continuous parameter that you can choose, right? So, so uh, 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 there's a jump in the number of degrees of freedom that you can have in your theory. And this shows up a lot um, uh, these days uh, when people, cosmologists, who are also field theorists, uh, who are trying to uh, so-called so modify gravity. Right? This is something that um, you will still see uh, on the archive quite, quite regularly. And the problem, and this comes, this, this basically shows the stock problem. Um, one of the reasons why people want to modify gravity is because um, they want to understand dark energy, and they want to understand uh, what is dark energy? And one of the possible ways to explain it is to say that maybe gravity doesn't behave the way we think it does. And so let's try to modify it. What's one way to modify gravity? One way to modify gravity is to, in fact, to give it a mass. 
But once you try to do the math, you will see that there are, there's immediately a jump in the number of degrees of freedom. So what accounts for these guys? What leads to the three other degrees of freedom? Okay, so people have, over the past 15, 20 years, there's been a lot of activity trying to uh, look at what's called massive gravity. Right? So let me just write it down. Massive gravity. Uh, half a circle, and so on. Right? So as you know, fermions 
uh, the case for fermions, when you go through two circles, then you come back to yourself. If you go through one circle, you come back to negative of yourself. You know what I'm saying? So, so this the boundary condition is very important. So if you start from side and you go through two pi, right? So whatever state that you are in, do you want to say that you got back to yourself, or do you want to say that you are only getting back to minus of yourself? Like that. This choice, I claim, will give you either integer m or half integer m. Okay. But there's only that but there are only two choices. Either you get plus or minus m. You'll find that the eigenvalues, eigenvalues only give you plus or minus m. And that's the helicity. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I was hoping to skip that, but that's it's the essence of how to work out the representation so as a tool. Uh, yeah, so the existence of these um, half integer uh, uh, modes is because of um, uh, topology, essentially. And uh, the fact that there are only two values is because this, this number can either be plus or minus, can, cannot be anything else. Cannot be, yeah, cannot, cannot be anything else for a given spin. Any other questions? Why uh, Messler's case you know, allows uh, the existence of a continuous spin? Yeah, so that part is a, con is a, is a so I should say that uh, I, um, uh, the, that group that I was describing is like a fictitious um, uh, Euclidean, I want to get it right, I think it's like a fictitious Euclidean group in uh, two dimensions. And so uh, uh, the continuous part is more like, I think, is more like momentum than real spin. Uh, so so, so it's, it's like that, right? So if you just talk about, for, for, for that relativity for the moment, right? So if you just do uh, quantum mechanics, right? B dot P, right? this is just quantum mechanics, right? So, so momentum is a generator of translations. And that uh, that itself uh, is is more like I think this is more like that than than uh, actual spin. I think it's just a name. Um, so so that's probably not a very good explanation. Right? It's, it's the it's the uh, combination of um, um, it's a combination of rotations and moves. That makes it like more like um, more like that than than, than uh, you know, spin. It's not rotations alone. That's what I'm saying, right? Rotations alone is to spin. Um, but but yeah, it's it's not easy to have a good intuitive understanding of what's what's going on there. Yeah, I've not also not thought about it very very uh, deeply myself. Um, yeah, I don't think Pascal and Schroeder talks about it even. Uh, if you want, I recommend looking at uh, Weinberg's uh, book. Okay. So if you're interested in this kind of questions, Weinberg uh, goes into a lot more detail than I have done so far. So if you look at Weinberg's QFT Volume 1. Okay, so this is the place to look at. Um, but it's, it's a bit tough. Uh, one of them is very difficult to understand. So, but but if you want, try 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 this. Okay. So, uh, is that uh, uh, for example, uh, L will uh, involve in the uh, spherical uh, harmonics, and mm -hmm. uh, spherical harmonics itself. Uh, oh, uh, obey the uh, boundary condition that uh, by rotate. It's a double cover because uh, you, after going through one revolution in SU2, you have gone back, you have actually rotated your system twice. You see, this is one, this is twice, right? 
uh, ordinary rotations will have gone through twice already. But as you do, you need to uh, 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 go through twice before you get back uh, the identity. But this is how fermions behave. Okay, let me just say this. So this is how fermions, this is uh, how fermions will be. In other words, this rotation operator is exactly the operator that will act on your fermionic wave function, uh, the two components, uh, while the spinner. In fact, I'll talk about this uh, uh, in, in a bit. Uh, it's exactly how you would um, uh, act on your spinners to rotate the wave function. Asked me about double cover, and what uh, what I think uh, I didn't say quite correctly the, the last time was that you asked me about the Lorentz group. Right? So this is where this is the warm up because what I'm going to try to do now is going to show you that uh, what double covers the um, uh, maybe I won't show you the whole the all all the details, but I do want to say that uh, there's something called S L two C, and S L two C is to the Lorentz group, like S to 2 is to the rotation group. So, uh, so this is what we're going to do. And why SL2C is important is because this is in fact how you construct uh, fermionic theories. Yeah, some of the technology, uh, in fact, people even use it for uh, amplitude calculations. So, so uh, this is another reason why I want to talk about it. Spinners show up for four-dimensional amplitude calculations. Uh, spinners, um, I think they call it the spinner helicity uh, formalism or something like that. So I'm going to give you at least a flavor of, of what people are talking about. Excuse me. Yeah. I just want to ask, what is the double code? Uh, so I, I just said it, right? So so you have to build S U two is by rotations, but S U two itself, if you want to come back to the identity, uh, well that's one way. Just don't rotate, right? But uh, in your ordinary rotations, if you don't want to do anything, you can rotate by two pi, and you come back to yourself. Okay. So the range of rotations is from zero to two pi for for ordinary rotations. But turns out for S U two, you don't come back to yourself after one revolution. You come back to negative identity. That's what I wrote on the board, uh, right, right here. Uh, this one, right, uh, this, this one is minus i. So that means that in S U two, you go around the circle in terms of theta, which means you have covered rotations, but once, but you don't come back to yourself in terms of SU2. You have to go through it twice, one more time. Then you get back to the identity. So there's a double cover in the sense that when you have come back to your identity uh, by circling yourself twice, you have already done ordinary rotation twice. You have covered all the possible uh, rotation elements twice. Right. So that's why it's called double cover. In other words, that's like a double redundancy. But in your own space, you're not redundant because you, you, you pick up a minus sign if you only went through one, one uh, rotation. Uh, one rotation, you need to do it one more time to get back to yourself truly. Yeah, yeah, that's what double color means. Two to one map, basically that's what it means. It's a two to one map. That's right, circle harmonic. Like that, yeah. That's the that's 
connect the L discrete. That's right. Uh, that's actually M. So, yes. so yeah, Y L M, Y L M. S L to C uh, will turn out to be, uh, like I said, uh, uh, to the Moran script, like S U two is to. SO3. And uh, phys physically, the physical importance is that this is how you construct fermionic uh, field theories. Understand what a wild spin is, uh, which is actually the basic object, uh, and then from that we we'll construct the direct spinner. Right? So this is not how direct does it, um, uh, but we will get there. Right? I just want to give you guys uh, a different perspective to to what you might find in Pascal and Schroeder, for example. Um, okay, so it will get a bit technical, but of course. We should ask questions. Okay. Um, so let's begin. Sigma a over 2 and 
minus sigma a star over 2 obey the SU2 or SO3 free algebra. Okay. And this will show up uh, uh, in, a bit. Uh, in particular, uh, what we discover is that this is why uh, SU2 is related to SU, SO3. And for that, for that situation, you find that actually both representations are equivalent in the sense that you can find a change of basis that will bring you from here to here and, and vice versa because the angles are real. But once you do boost, the Lorentz group has boost. Uh, once you do boost, the, uh, the analogous rotation angles, and not rotation angles anymore, the uh, uh, boost parameters are no longer, um, that part is no longer permission. And therefore, uh, when you do boost, it's no longer equivalent. These two actually give you key equivalent representations of the Lorentz group. Okay. So the other important uh, thing to uh, to know is that there's a two-dimensional Navichivita symbol. And for the homo, you, you'll end up playing around with some identities that will be important for uh, understanding all this technology, all this spinner, spinner technology. So in particular, uh, I'm just going to define uh, my downstairs synthesis to be the same as the upstairs synthesis one. It's a definition. It's a one. And therefore, once I define it by like that, then epsilon to one will be equals to epsilon uh, uh, to one upstairs, which will be minus one. Okay, so this will imply this. Uh, and if you just do a direct calculation, you find that epsilon is basically an orthogonal, uh, uh, is an orthogonal matrix in the sense that when you multiply itself by the, the transpose, you get the identity. Or sometimes I like to write it as dagger. Right? It's, it's the same because it's real anyway. So, so dagger is transpose. And what you find is that, for example, um, um, oh, I want to introduce one more thing. So, so these are the, the uh, spatial, uh, so to speak, public matrices. I is one, two, three. Oops. Okay. So uh, I need to introduce a different notation. If I write sigma mu, then I mean sigma zero and then sigma i. So zero, one, two, three. And why I say this is because sigma one, uh, sigma zero uh, is actually the identity. And it turns out that if I include the identity together with sigma i, these actually are complete. These span the space of two by two matrices. Okay, which means that they are complete. And what that means is, for those who are not familiar with linear algebra, this span just means that any any two by two matrix can be gotten by superposing this guy. So maybe I'll write it down because I'm going to use it in, in a little bit. So if I use P mu, sigma mu, this means I'm summing over all the mu's. P0 will be written down once, just to make sure that you guys understand what I mean. So P0 sigma 0 is just P0 times the 2 by 2 identity plus P1 sigma 1 plus P2 sigma 2 plus P3 sigma 3. And the claim is that this object over here is a superposition of these matrices, and this can be any 2 by 2 matrix. What I mean by that is that if you give me any 2 by 2 matrix, I can adjust my P0, P1, P2, P3 in a way that uh, I, can, I can give you whatever matrix you gave me, I can give you back that matrix you just gave me. Okay? Uh, that's what it means by complete. 
You can construct, I can reconstruct anything you gave me. Um, why this is important is, is because this will relate, uh, this will turn out to often uh, relate sigma mu to something else that I'm going to call sigma bar mu. Not to be confused with complex conjugation. This is not complex con conjugation. Okay. Uh, what what is that? It's actually just the same guy, but with a minus sign. Okay. So this is the definition. And. Uh, how is epsilon related uh, uh, to all this? You find that, for example, uh, epsilon times sigma i star times epsilon will in fact be field. Actually, let's do epsilon's dagger, which is my, minus sigma i. Okay. If you take the complex conjugate and you sandwich between epsilon and epsilon dagger, which is you should view it as when you change your basis. Right? When you change your basis of the sigma i star, you will get back minus i. And what that means is that if you do not sigma i but sigma mu, star epsilon dagger, what you get is actually sigma bar mu. Okay? I did talk to you over again. But anyway, so um, I wanted to give you an example uh, okay, uh, why this is the case. Well, why this is important. Uh, I think since I did your homework, I'm going to let you guys read it, uh, read some of these details um, because I don't want to make it a habit of doing your homework. Uh, what is also important, which we will use repeatedly, is the other important uh, fact about power matrices, which is that it turns out you can compute the exponential explicitly because of this algebra. It turns out that you can uh, by by brute force essentially. Take for example, um, let me write it down i over two psi j sigma j, and you will find that this is equal to cosine of square root psi j psi j is the sum of the components uh, over 2 minus i psi j sigma j over again square root of psi j psi j times psi of the same thing square root psi j psi j let me, let me make the The vector sign is just square root of psi j psi j. And I believe I did this calculation a while ago and found that psi can be even complex. Okay, so this can hold even if psi is complex. Psi j can be complex. And this would turn out to be useful. Because now you have an explicit expression for the exponential. Right? Uh, many books, when you talk about Lie, Lie groups, they will try to just look at the generators, they will expand it uh, to first order, maybe second order, and so on. But for SU2 uh, and for SL2C, 
you can actually work it out uh, in full, in, in exactly using this property. Okay. Um, and I think one of your homeworks, in, in fact, is to is in fact to do this, to use this to do some calculations. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a bit more about that once we do the range transformations. Um, yes. What's the physical meaning of sigma bar? This one? Uh, yeah, yeah. So now I'm just laying out some of the properties of sigma. But you will find that later on, uh, these things will show up. Uh, all these objects will show up in the Dirac equation. In the wild, uh, the wild equation and also the Dirac equation. Yeah. So since you are second, so the wild equation, there are two equations. One is I sigma mu partial mu, uh, I like to call it L, uh, maybe I'll call it psi uh, lambda, yeah, lambda equals to zero. And then the other equation is pi sigma mu, partial mu, and then rho. So these are the wild equations. And they're not the same. This is not the same as this equation. E even though it looks like only a minus sign difference, it's actually not the same equation. This is what's called the left-handed spin-up. That's the right-handed spin-up. And then, uh, you notice there's no mass. There's no scale of this problem at all. Okay? So this is actually the massless direct equation. Okay? It's not how you were taught. Uh, that's not how Cassian and Schroeder would teach you. But essentially, it's the same thing. Uh, but when you combine them into one, so the direct spin-up, will be, in fact, the combination of lambda and rho. And once you do that, you might, you are then able to introduce a mass to your spinner. And then your equation will look like the following. You, you will now, uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get there, right? But there will be a 4 by 4 matrix minus m, all acting on sum. And this is the direct equation. This is where we're going. So that since you answer already the answer is great. So the wild equation for massless fermions, this is the direct equation for massive fermions. Uh, but to understand, I can just write it down right now, right? But but where does it come from? Uh, I want to give you guys a, a deeper understanding. It comes from trying to use the fact that SL2C, in fact, it's like the spin half, it gives you the spin half representations that you discover in the Morang group. That's the key point. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I, I'm getting that. So be, be patient. Um, yes. So the other property that about the public matrices, um, Related to the concept of helicity. So I, I just told you guys that helicity is the projection of momentum along spin. And if you think of quantum mechanics, you know that in fact spin half is rep represented exactly by these Pauli matrices. Right? Because the eigenvalues of sigma is plus minus one. And so spin, so if you remember your uh, when you learn now that you say quantum mechanics, spin is in fact given by sigma over 2. Okay, so for example, there's a spin dot magnetic field interaction. The spin, this is in fact how we uh, understood uh, spin. Right? It wasn't true relativity first. It was true uh, lab experiments where people 
look at the shift in the atomic energy levels coming from turning on magnetic fields or electric fields and watching how it interacts with the spin of the electron orbiting the nucleus. But uh, 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 once we understood it now, uh, we see that it really is more fundamental than these public physicists, as you will see, shows up in these representations of the Lorentz group. So helicity is, remember, um, is uh, spin along uh, momentum. And, and so uh, what we can do is we can define a unit momentum vector and we can ask what happens when I got it into uh, these poly matrices. And if you use real, if this is real momentum, okay, uh, then you'll find that this whole thing is permission. Okay, and and so, and so this will be permission. And again, if you remember your linear algebra, because it's permission, you expect to be able to diagonalize it uh, for a given momentum. And these are, in fact, what's called the helicity eigenstates. So, um, so if you take this operator and you find that after diagonalization, diagonalize it, then you find that there are two states, which I'm going to call C, plus, and minus. Okay. And these will give me the eigenvalues plus or minus C plus minus. That's why I label them plus or minus. It just labels the eigenvalues of these guys. And these are the hemicity eigenstates. And in terms of these operators, now I'm going to start introducing some notation. So this is a two by two. This is a two by two matrix. Right? So these are real numbers contracted into the poly matrices, but it's a sum over two by two matrices. So therefore, I can write this as the following. I can write this p hat i sigma i sigma i. As a as the A B component, if I look at look at this guy as a matrix, I can ask what is the A B component. I'm going to put a dot on the B uh, of this object, which is just P hat. Okay, because I know what these guys are. These are my bases. But what is given? What is a, a, a function of of what I give you? Is p right? So p can vary, but the sigmas are what it is. They are the basis, they are the basis uh, 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 operators. So I can view this as kind of like a change of basis. And in fact, I can also do it for the form momentum. Later on, we'll do it for the form momentum as well. And so this guy can also write it as p a b dot. In fact, this one, we will see later on, is like a change of basis. It looks a little bit funny. Uh, what do I mean by change of basis? Instead of p mu, I claim that I can represent a four vector in terms of this two component object instead. There is a direct correspondence. If I give you this, I can give you this. If I give you this, I can give you that. Right. And look, so that's funny. This is a four vector. This is a two by two matrix. Right. So, so how, how yeah, what's going on there? Uh, but at least the number of components match up, right? Because a four vector has four components. A two by two matrix has also four components. So at least the number of components match up with each other. So how do you convert between each other? 
Uh, it turns out that exactly because the, uh, let me complete this thing first actually. So it turns out that this helicity I can see, as you know, so if you, if you remember the linear algebra, if you have a permission operator, you can always expand it in terms of this eigen, eigen, uh, eigen state, where this is the diagonal form of it. Um, so this guy's permission, so you should be able to run it as plus, the first eigen value is plus, uh, and then the C plus A, C plus complex conjugate B, that, D, B dot, and then minus, because the second eigen value is minus, C minus A, and then C minus B dot complex conjugate. It's complex conjugate because this is a graph. Yeah, so when you calculate it in a, in a uh, position basis, uh, it's, it's a, or, or in some basis, it will give you this complex conjugate. Um, this will show up uh, in, 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 in the direct equation as well. But, um, so how do you change your basis? change your basis based on uh, the completeness of of these signals. Okay. Uh, because this, this AB notation comes from the AB component of A of sigma B. So let me just tell you what the identity is uh, and skip the technicalities because it's a little bit um, it's, a, it's quite technical. Uh, so let me just tell you what it is. So let's say you give me um, the public matrices. It will turn out the following. Uh, I first will have to uh, define upper and lower indices. So if I have sigma mu a b dot uh, well, firstly, the, the bunch of indices I can move. One is the uh, Lorentz index, and one are these uh, spinner indices. Okay, so this will turn out to be spinner indices. And why they're called spinner indices is because they are indices essentially on these helicity eigenstates. And these helicity eigenstates will turn out to be intimately related to the wild and direct equations that I, I wrote down earlier. Okay. So, but let me just uh, do it sequentially. Okay. So, uh, if I have something like sigma mu bar mu and and dot, I will use the Navier beta to now move my indices. So uh, I need to be careful which index I contract with, but because I'm going to move two of them, it doesn't matter for now. So let me just do it. Uh, C M epsilon and D. So as long as you do it uh, 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 consistently, if I do it with the right guy, then this guy I need to do it with the right guy as well. If I have two of them, then it doesn't matter. You can do it with left or right, but make sure you do it with the, the same. If you do it with left, the right guy, you must do it with the right guy here. This, in fact, is sigma mu bar C D dot. Okay? It's a definition. And likewise with um, Likewise with uh, with this guy, you can also define something similar. But this is enough for what we want to do. Okay, so I have first I have one identity that looks like this. Uh, I have one half sigma mu a b dot, and then I have sigma bar mu. So. But if you have a more specific question, um, I can try to answer it. Yeah, let me let me move on for now. Right? But but if you have a more specific question, just talk me and and I can talk more about it. I just want to at least introduce to you guys 
what what the heck SL2C is. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I had to explain that part. Yeah, yeah, I had to explain that part. It's, it's uh, just briefly, it's related to this complex conjugation. So you see that every time the B dot, the dot shows up, is because of this complex conjugation. But why is special? Uh, I have to first tell you something about SL2C first. Then, then I will explain. Yeah, but so if I ever forget, uh, please remind me. I have, I don't need to talk to you. Come, come again? The AB. AB? L, P, mu, sigma, mu, L, dagger, 
what happens is that I get, remember the determinant of A times B is the determinant of A times the determinant of B. So I get the determinant of L, the determinant of this guy is P squared, and the determinant of L dagger, and it will turn out to be therefore just the absolute value squared of the determinant of L times P squared. So now, let me tell you what is the name of SL2C. And then I'll tell you how it's connected with this. SL2C, as you, as you may remember, S is special, which again means the determinant of all the, of all the matrices in the group is one. Oops. Right. So I put a curly bracket just to mean all the matrices that obey this condition. This is what special means. L just means it's a linear transformation. 2C just means it's a two by two complex matrix. Okay. So uh, maybe not all of you are uh, uh, familiar with this way of writing determinants, but if I take the determinant of a N by N matrix, it turns out that you can write it in terms of like Chivita. So in, in N by N would mean the following. I get I1 all the way to IN, and I'll contract it with the, either the row or the column number uh, of, of, of the matrix. This would be 1, A, I, 2, 2, all the way to I, A, I, N, N. Okay. Have you guys seen this before for the determinant of the matrix? So for example, if you have a two by two matrix, what do you do? So the determinant of the two by two matrix will be therefore epsilon ij, there are only two components, it will be li1, lj2. Okay. But then, uh, this is anti-symmetric. So if I swap one and two, I can also swap i and j but that will cost me a minus sign. So I can actually write it in a slightly more general sense. Epsilon i j, l i a, l j b. So that now I can allow a b to be r b should be. If a b are the same, because this is anti-symmetric, I get zero. If a b is one, two, one, two, like that, I get determinant of l times one. If I get uh, if I put 2, 1, then like I said, you can swap them around by the cost of my sign. So therefore, this must be just proportional to epsilon A, B. So what does SL2 mean? I can therefore basically define it using just one equation. Just like you remember, uh, the Lorentz group can be summed up, the Lorentz group remember, can be summed up into this, this formula. Remember, it, it is the group of matrices that leave the special relativity metric in beta. So SL2C, in turn, can be uh, summed up as this equation, that it leaves this language we got symbol in beta. So L leaves Epsilon in okay. That's what SL2C. Is. Well, what does that mean for a Lorentz group? Notice that this is determinant of L squared. So if you choose determinant of L equals one, so strictly speaking, you just need the absolute value to be one. But because of this nice property that it, it obeys this involving Levi-Chivita, uh, we are going to exploit it. Right? So if you choose the community one, then what you see is that under SL2C transformations, so under SL2C transformations, you find that the determinant of P mu sigma mu remains the same. 
But what does that mean? It means that you get P squared going to itself. If P squared going, if P squared goes to itself, you have to start to suspect. You have to start to suspect that whatever I did. Remember, this is a matrix. So whatever L and L dagger does, this is a matrix. Right? It doesn't give you, it doesn't give you P mu sigma mu back. This is not P mu sigma mu anymore. Remember, I did something to it. The determinant is P squared. But whatever this turns out to be, remember sigma mu is complete. Right? Sigma mu is a complete set of bases. So it has to give me some mu P prime mu sigma mu. Okay? And whatever mu sigma pr uh, P prime mu, right? remember, remember, I know that it has to give me a superposition of sigma mu back because this is a set of complete matrices. So whatever the mu P prime is must be a Lorentz transform P. Okay? This is an important point here. P prime must be some Lorentz transform version of the OP. Because how else can I possibly get uh, the inner product, the, the dot product to be preserved? Right? Because I know the determinant is uh, preserved. Therefore, it has to be that P prime is just nothing but a Lorentz transform version of P. And that's why when you take the determinant, you get back P squared. And so next time, uh, I think I'm out of time, yeah. So next time, we'll in fact discuss more. Uh, maybe I'll write it down uh, for now. What we'll find is that L will in fact take the so next time. Let me write it down. Uh, we'll explicitly construct what L takes, what form L takes. And we'll see that there are two types. One is that it's an exponential of sigma, remember all the generators are sigma over 2. But now you'll find that there's a C which indicates boost and then there is a rotation. Right? So there's boost and rotation. And then there's an L star. There's a complex conjugate which you can work out is just uh, C plus I theta all dotted into C, uh, sigma star over 2. Okay, and I claim that these two are not equivalent. You cannot find a change of basis that breaks you from here to here. It's not possible. And so we'll find, we'll discover why this is the most general form and then uh, remind ourselves that this, how these guys are actually related to Lorenz transform. Any questions for me? So, uh, as a as a two C also and double cover on the two. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, I think the easy way, at least the rotation part, uh, is easy to see. Right, you just turn off the you just turn off the boost part. It's exactly as you do, and that is the double cover of the rotation part. Yeah, yeah. But, but it again, it comes down to this fact of two here. Good. See you guys on Friday.